So to go right back from the beginning, you know, what's a modern InTouch app? What do we mean when we use that phrase? Well, it's an InTouch application that lets us use orchestral graphics. The situational awareness library, if um, you're using the situational awareness kind of design concept or high efficiency graphics, allows you to use .NET controls. A lot of the newer functionality that uh, that has came about um, from the integration in the system platform, but now down into the familiar window maker, window viewer environment. So it allows us to stay within the typical in-touch areas that people know and love without having to learn a lot of new stuff. So it takes some of this old, our, our older framework and gives us that new functionality into it. So, you know, why did we do this? Well, there were a lot of people, whenever we did get it in front of a group, and asked people how many people were, uh, asked groups how many people were using orchestral graphics, not a lot of hands would go up. You know, it was something that people were aware of, but it wasn't something that people were really using. And why? You no, know, there was some, some misconceptions out there. <clears throat> People were under the belief maybe that orchestral graphics weren't considered in-touch content, that it was something that was built around system platform. But even though the idea, the concept originally came with system platform, they've always been used within in-touch. They've always been embedded in Window Maker, always been viewed within Window Viewer. And even though there are some nice uh, added functionalities when you're using these graphics within system platform, They've always been able to be used just with InTouch. They could connect to the InTouch tag name dictionary and get their data from InTouch. So it wasn't just an app server. <clears throat> People were thinking that maybe there was you know, extra features and functionality that were needed. And no, when you got your InTouch development package, you, we included the orchestra graphics. So there was nothing extra from there. And there was still kind of a belief that this was development outside of InTouch. But no, InTouch has always been a, a major component. InTouch will never go away. And some of these things that were kind of added onto InTouch, you know, were kind of considered add-ons, but they really shouldn't have been. So I'm going to kind of show you how these integrate a lot easier now. Excuse me. <clears throat> Other reasons why people weren't using orchestra graphics? Well, InTouch did everything they needed. They didn't want to go up to something, you know, with more functionality. They didn't want to learn how to use the app server components, such as the IDE, to be able to manage their in-touch applications. Although there are some very nice features to the IDE and some great reasons to do that um, as a central management um, kind of organization. Um, won't get into those today, but you know, it's still people didn't want that. They wanted to stay within in-touch. And they didn't want to have to retrain somebody to learn new utilities. So what was the answer? a modern in-touch application. <clears throat> so why did we want to use orchestral graphics in the first place? The obvious reason, well, they're pretty. It's a larger library. It's a lot more options, a lot more functionality than what we used to have. But a lot of other reasons as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. As I'm sure most of you, if not all of you know, when we're using memory tags within in-touch for whether it's temporary storage to, to pass data into sim we've created, and that counted against our tag count. Custom properties, when we create these within our orchestral graphics, they don't. So it gives us a, a little more uh, use out of our in-touch. There's an enormous amount of reuse compared to standard in-touch graphics. We can export the individual graphics, import them into new applications without having to do a full window export and imports. That management reusability of the graphics much higher than it was. There's obviously much more advanced graphics. You know, we have transparencies and gradients and shadings and, um, you know, multi-point tools. The use of the uh, Windows controls are much easier. So a lot more animations available. We have uh, orientations and point trends. And um, we'll see. I'll show you some of the animations when we get into the actual product demo. But there's certainly a lot, a lot more functionality there that uh, enforcement of standards, because we can provide these orchestral graphics, export them out, have people import them or provide them to an integrator or to other developers within the system. So we can always ensure that 
you know, the same pump or the same motor control, the same inverter control is used across all of the projects or within the same project. .NET controls, you know, InTouch is only supported by or only supports ActiveX controls, which are still pretty commonly used, but, you know, it's, it's older technology. Not only the .NET controls, but .NET scripting as well. It gives you a lot of access, a lot of control over the system if you're a .NET programmer. We've all seen InTouch graphics be either stretched or skewed or just not look very good after resizing and of these orchestral graphics are vector based so they will resize much better and we know with the different uh, form factors out there today from a you know three and a half inch uh, touch screen all the way up to 4k <laughs> you know, 70 inch monitors our form factor sizing difference can be astronomical the older InTouch days is much harder to manage than it is with using orchestral graphics. Uh, there's a wizard editor to make your graphics a little more reusable, and I'll talk, I've got a few slides about that. Element styles, so to be able to set and make global changes of, of text values within all of your graphics are really easily done. Same with the format uh, of your numeric styles, so if everything, you know, wanted to be rounded up after the third decimal place or whatever. Have you. We can force the global changes across all of the graphics. Connectors and connection points instead of um, just drawing your lines and having to move them when you resize, and so much more. You'll see, I'll give you a, a quick tour of the graphic editor, and it's a very impressive uh, editor. It's really nicely done, and there's a, there's a ton that we can do with it. It's not quite Photoshop, <laughs> but it's pretty close. So how do we accomplish this? Well, we just had to add in a little bit in touch. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the thing that we needed to add in in its, in its most simplest form is the graphic toolbox. And this is where all of the orchestra graphics, either the pre-built ones in the library or the ones that we've created are, are going to be included. Just to blow up of it there. So we'll see our, our traditional libraries, our orchestra symbol library and our situational awareness library. We can create our own tool sets in there. We can import graphics in, export graphics out. So this is our tie-in to that uh, orchestra environment. If there's an existing graphic, we can just grab it from there, <clears throat> drag and drop it over onto the screen, assign its in touch tags, and away we go. Or we can create a new graphic, add existing ones into it, make any changes to them, and then save it and reuse it as many times as possible, or as necessary, I should say. When it comes to assigning text to the graphic, to their animations, that's where we'll use the custom properties. And when we talk about the wizard options, they're set directly in, um, in Window Maker now. So either duplicating the graphics, dragging them in, configuring the options, and of course, like everything else in InTouch, we have the dockable toolbar. So you put it on the left-hand side, the right-hand side, auto-hide, whatever you would like with that particular toolbox. And now we don't have to go in and out of that uh, window maker environment like we had to with the managed apps. So you'll never see an IDE. You're going to use the InTouch application manager, runtime in the window viewer. So no, no new tools to learn. You'll see in the orchestral graphics editor, it's a little bit different than, you know, just kind of creating your, in, your graphics in InTouch and creating symbols and cells from there. It's so much more flexible. You'll see a little bit more complexity, infinitely more flexibility. When it comes to the custom properties, now these are where we're going to be you know, assigning uh, tags and I.O. to our animations. So they're typically created in the orchestra graphic editor. So things like our, you know, a level in the case of a level meter, temperature in the case of a temperature meter, RPMs, what have you. And then when we embed those into the InTouch window, that's when we can assign it to an InTouch tag um, directly from the tag name dictionary. And they'll be set up, you know, any of our standard data types. <clears throat> and uh, these are really just a way that we can make these graphics reusable. So as we embed these graphics into an InTouch window, you can decide which piece of equipment and which tags are getting this data. And then if, um, you know, the next instance that we put in there it's kind of a new new instance of that graphic. We can assign our tags to it and uh, and use it over and over again. Symbol wizards I've talked about.
about a few times. I'm not going to give you a huge demo on the symbol. It's very powerful technology. <clears throat> Excuse me. It allows us to have fewer symbols um, and helps us to enforce those standards. It's uh, a lot lower weight because they had only loads of stuff that it needs in runtime. And this is a good example of a of a where a symbol wizard comes in. So in our in our orchestral graphic library, in our black and chrome pilot lights, you can see we've got you know whatever 15 different uh, pilot lights here. And what are the difference between these pilot lights? Really two things. There's the bezel thickness and the color of the pilot light. So why did we need 15 different symbols? Well, we did at the time, because when the original orchestral graphic library that we're using was created, we didn't have the symbol wizard technology. If we were to create all these from scratch right now, we would end up with one graphic <coughs> with a couple of wizard options. And those options could be configured in the touch. And option number one, we'd get a pull down menu, it'd be color, or could be color. And then option number two, bezel thickness, you know, and thicker, thickest. That way we can just kind of keep and maintain that one symbol. And when we create that in the orchestral graphic editor, um, it's kind of done um, with rules almost showing and hiding layers. So we have one layer on top, another, a layer with, with blue, a layer with green, a layer with orange, and so on. And as you choose the options from the pull down menu, if we chose green, it hides all the other color layers except for the green. So it's uh, you know, fairly simple concept when it comes to that, but as you can see, it becomes really, uh, really powerful when you have graphics that, that look the same, but you don't want to create separate ones each time. When we look at our situational awareness graphics, these are all created using technology. <clears throat> and this is a good example because in the case of our situational aware meter, there's so many different settings, different meter types, whether it shows the alarm conditions, um, even the orientation, whether it's horizontal or vertically aligned. Does it show the value? Does it show the set point? Is there a timer in there? We can even put a single pen trend in there to see where the data is coming from. And so that one symbol does have over a thousand different uh, potential configurations for it. So there's a lot of, uh, if I were to pull that one up and, uh, and show it, there's certainly a lot of different pull down menus, <laughs> a lot of different, uh, different options to configure it. But again, instead of creating a thousand different symbols, we've created the, the one and given you the options of how you want to use it. So some pretty powerful technology. <clears throat> when it comes to... Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, it looks like we're having some audio issues. So what I'll do is I am going to post to, uh, to everyone here the, the conference call number. So if it's... Uh, if everybody's having the audio issues as well, and I apologize, I was going to do that right from the bat. The number is 1-886-596-5280. And the conference ID is 9801142. I'm getting some feedback yet. The audio is okay for some. So, anybody that is having some or having some audio issues, I'll give a, a few minutes here. Just go into the uh, that 1-800 number, punch in that conference ID, and that uh, that'll get you on. We're kind of simulcasting here. <laughs> so, uh, it looks like we're having a few people coming back with okay audio. So, so that's good. I apologize, uh, guys. Are digital? Um, if there's any questions, anything that uh, that you missed, you can just put the questions into the chat, and uh, I can always kind of come back to that, or if it's something a little more in depth at the end after I do the the product demo. Oh, I hear somebody uh, just came onto the line there, heard the beep, so hopefully that uh, that'll come in a little bit better. <coughs> Excuse me. So. We are, I should mention here, now that I've uh, kind of stopped, that we are recording this as well. So if there was somebody that, uh, you know, you think would benefit from this or later you want to, you know, look over it again, if you want to hear my lovely voice one more time, uh, it'll be posted, I assume, on our website. Uh, we can get everybody at the link at the end of that. So, so I'll keep on going here. <clears throat> when it comes to creating a new modern InTouch application, 
it's really no different than we would create uh, a regular InTouch application. And I'll do that as part of the product demo as well. So we would just go into the standard InTouch application manager like we've had for, for decades now. And the only difference you'll see when we go in to create a new application, you'll have two options. And it will default to the modern InTouch application because that's really what we want people to use. That's where our new technology is. But if for whatever reason, <coughs> excuse me, you don't want the orchestra graphics, uh, we still give people the option of creating a legacy InTouch application. So we, you know, obviously we want you to use the new stuff, but if you don't want to, for whatever reason, you're a complete holdout, you can still create a legacy app. When you create that modern InTouch application, it'll create everything that it needs in the background. And uh, when it opens up, it'll look like InTouch with a few just tiny little differences. And I'll show you that in my, uh, in my demo. Now, if you have an existing uh, application, a legacy InTouch app, now whether it's from an older version typically, <clears throat> or a newer one and you've changed your mind, we can migrate quite easily. And the migration procedure really is to, uh, well, there's a few different reasons you might want to migrate. Of course, you know, if InTouch, and we still see that in a lot of cases, there's a lot of InTouch, even version 4 right there running on, uh, on NT 4.0. And if it's not broke, hey, sometimes don't fix it. But some cases, replacing parts of that old PC or getting updates because somebody wants to now suddenly get that PC online. It's getting very difficult, if not impossible, or incredibly expensive to, to get those fixed. And of course, you know, InTouch has came a long way since then. So if somebody wants to add some functionality to it, yeah, we're going to have to move up in the world. Things that the migrations won't take care of, of course, are application issues, uh, things that just didn't work properly within the application, graphics that have already been messed up. Uh, this won't change existing graphics. Uh, but what it will fix, of course, is the compatibility issues, the securities, the, the network issues that, that you may have had. Sometimes there's, you know, believe it or not, there were some bugs floating around in some of our older software versions that, you know, have been fixed over the years. So it certainly wouldn't be the first time <clears throat> that we've had some lingering issues. Somebody has migrated the application to a later version, and then we find out, thankfully, that you know, that issue was fixed somewhere along the line. So, yeah, I know a lot of people don't upgrade to the latest version just because, but in some cases when there are issues, even though it's one that may not be documented in the later version, much easier to go up to that version than to be able to fix those, those issues then after that. So, converting just the orchestra graphics gives us, uh, leaves us within that uh, familiar environment of Window Maker and Window Viewer, gives us the .NET controls, and it's still a type-based application. We'll put that under the benefits and the downsides because there are a lot of nice features when we go to an object-oriented environment such as system platform, but you get um, you get a lot more uh, overhead, so to speak, from that. It's, it is a different animal. Uh, one of the things that I've had people say were a downside, which you just have to be a little bit aware of, is that when it comes to the application management, so the backup um, and the moving of an InTouch app now, a little bit different. Um, the old days, we just go into that InTouch folder, you know, grab that application, zip it up, move it wherever we wanted to, or just copy it for a backup. It's not that really, really any trickier right now, but it is different. And we just have to go in the InTouch application manager and export it. And I'll show you that in a, in a demo as well. So, Back to my converting, when we are migrating, it really is very simple. When we open up that old InTouch app, <coughs> excuse me, it's going to give us an option. Well, of course, it's going to ask us if we want to migrate the application. If we said no at this point in time, it's just going to shut down <laughs> because we can't keep it as a 9.5 application and open it in 2014 R2. We do have to migrate it. But then the, the next pop-up gives us the option. It'll tell us it's not enabled for the use of our custom graphics. Would we like to enable it? If we say no, it's going to create a legacy InTouch app at the latest version. If we say yes, it creates a modern InTouch app and allows us to use the orchestra graphics. Again, it doesn't change any of the graphics in the app. It doesn't um, turn anything into orchestra graphics, although I'll show you some neat tips and tricks for that. <clears throat> but it allows us to use that moving forward. 
And the one thing that I'll show you, <coughs> excuse me, is I'll open up um, one of our old demo apps. We can convert that to a modern app, and then you can take entire InTouch windows and convert them into Orchestra graphics. <coughs> so if we had a window in, say, 800 by 600, which is what I'll do, um, to convert that, to change that to a larger size screen, really, I think we've all seen uh, what happens when we allow InTouch to try and convert these InTouch graphics. They never really work very well. It looks pretty ugly. This will allow us to take that entire window, convert it into an in-touch graphic, and then resize it ourselves. So we'd still do that separate resizing, typically, because we can still change the aspect ratio and, and see what, and I'll show you that. But it uh, it takes everything, converts it into one graphic, makes it really easy to, uh, to recreate it. <coughs> it'll do the ActiveX controls, uh, it'll give you a conversion report on the other side, and so on. So I'll, I'll show that as part of my demo as well. And hey, look at that. It's time to, uh, to stop watching me do the PowerPoint and uh, we'll go on to the software. So, I'll open up, excuse me, the InTouch application. As you can see, very little, if any, difference from here since, well, 9.5 is a slight little bit different just from the, uh, the UI, but uh, anything 10.1 and higher uh, looks identical. We still got our new InTouch app. And here, like we can see, do we create a modern app or legacy app? I'll create the modern application. It's going to ask us where we want to store the default. Again, same thing as it's done for quite some time now. What's the directory? And I'll call it whatever my test apps directory. And the name of the application itself. I'll call it webinar test. <laughs> Could have obviously put my description in there to be a little more uh, descriptive, <laughs> but uh, I'll just create it. Now, what it's going to do, if I show you the, the details here, anybody familiar with application server and the Galaxy repository setup? That's kind of what it's doing in the background. It's making a database so it can access the Orchestra graphics, the .NET framework, everything that we used to have to do with a managed InTouch app that we had to do manually. And uh, previous to this, we had to open the IDE, you know, set up the uh, Galaxy repository, create the platforms. And again, there was some really nice features for that. But it was kind of, a, it was a big learning curve and it was a separate utility that people didn't want to learn. So if I didn't show details here, and most times we don't have to, you would know it takes a little longer, as you can see, to create that InTouch app. But it's doing all this for you in the background. <clears throat> we'll see at the end, it'll finish. Finish. It'll shut this screen. There we go. Everything is successful. And it's just going to think about it for another second. It'll bring up our InTouch app at this name. Or it'll give us the, um, the name, the path. And like if we created a legacy InTouch app from here, you know, it doesn't quite know the resolution, the versions at zero, and all of that, just because I haven't opened it yet. But we can see it knows it's a modern app. And again, standard window maker will take me into it. <coughs> When it comes up, you'll see very little, if any, difference from uh, from what we used to see in just a, a regular a legacy InTouch application, other than the Orchestra Graph box, which I'll make just a little bit smaller. <laughs> um, if you've used InTouch in the last few versions, we've had the project view in there as well. So you can see I've turned that one off because I never really liked the project view. I'm more of a classic uh, kind of person, so I go to the to the classic view. We've got the Orchestra Graphic Toolbox, and really the only other difference here is a link to embed the Orchestra Graphic in a window, which just really gives us access to this toolbox over here. So just the same as we would normally do, we create a, you know, a home window, work with our Orchestra Graphics, or work with our InTouch windows, sorry, same as we always would. But now we have the Graphic Toolbox with a much, uh, a much larger, more robust area than we had before. So I won't focus so much on the situational awareness. Um, there is going to be an upcoming webinar on the, the ideas behind situational awareness and the design concepts behind it, which is really interesting. The more I learn about it, the more I, I'm a convert to the situational awareness methodology. But when you just look at the library uh, kind of in a basic form, it, it looks uh, just kind of ugly, to be honest with you. It's not until you really 
go through the design concepts there. It becomes really powerful. So I'll just focus on the, uh, the prettier graphics here for now. So as you can see, it is a fairly extensive library. Uh, I don't have a count. I should try and find one for stuff like this on how many pre-built graphics there are. But any of these pre-built graphics, we could change, reuse, add to our own, and so on. So if we're, for example, into the meters and over one of the available graphics, we do have a tool tip that shows how the graphics looks. And in its simplest form, just as a standard library, we could just grab them from here, you know, oops, put them out on the screen. When it comes to assigning them to an IO, now I don't have any tags yet, but I can just make a couple real quick. Double clicking takes us to the custom properties. These, this is where we would set our tags now to our in-touch tagging dictionary. And as you can see, kind of the, the standard stuff, we have a value, the min and the max. Now, depending on the gra graphic that we're using and, and the animations it has and what it does, of course, there'll be different properties. We can add our own. And just like we would within oops, any um, in-touch thing, I'll just say tag one. Now, it's going to ask me to define that tag because it doesn't exist yet. Just the same as if we were using any animation within in-touch. And it takes us right to our in-touch tag name dictionary. So I'll just, uh, just so we've got something in here, I'll make it a memory real. And I'll give it an initial value, I'll say 25.0. Save it. And close it. Now I could set, let me open that back up. I could set its min value to uh, tag one dot min engineering units and the max value to tag one dot max engineering units. So I still have access to all the dot fields of the in touch tag name dictionary. Nothing's been blocked from there. And you know, if I went into rent, obviously it's not going to move much because I set it to a static value. But um, you know, it's as simple as that to use the orchestra, orchestra graphic library. <clears throat> so there's my meter at, at 25. Now, because these have a, a template and instance kind of hierarchy, every time I make a new meter or put a new one whoops, out onto the screen, it's going to be available to assign to new I.O. And I could make that to tag two, another one to tag three, and so on. I can use as many of these as I want uh, within my application. They're all going to be separate instances tied to their own separate I.O. But you do have to keep in mind, sometimes it can be a good thing, sometimes it can be a bad thing, that these do still have a tie back to the, um, to the original graph that we put them out. So really great if we do want to make global changes. Maybe we don't like the, the color of the needle, uh, what have you. So if there's something that you do want to change in every graphic, I can come back to the parent graphic in here. Let's double click on it if I can moving instead of clicking. <clears throat> This opens up the orchestra graphic editor or the orchestra symbol editor. So you can see quite a bit more options when it comes to the various individual tools than we had within standard InTouch. Uh, availability of all of the, uh, the Windows controls, really nice and easy to use. Um, fills, patterns, and so on. And, <laughs> and that's exactly what I was going to do. David, uh, David popped up with a message, could we remove the glare from the graphic? And it's always, uh, <laughs> wouldn't have been better if I'd asked that question myself. It's always funny. I point this out in the training that uh, you can tell that some of these were built by graphic designers, not by process engineers or maintenance people or people who work with the stuff because they added that really annoying light glare into uh, all of the uh, all the objects. From, a, from an artistic and a design perspective, yeah, it looks great. From a usability perspective, it's annoying as hell. So <clears throat> within the, uh, these uh, graphics, you can see now that I've opened up the graphic itself, I have access to all the individual levels or elements on all their different levels and um, all of the animations. <clears throat> Excuse me, I could add things to it and delete things. So in the case where that gloss is kind of annoying, I want to get rid of it, I can just delete it. If I did want to change something that, uh, just so we've got a little more visual, if I wanted to change the color of the needle. Uh, I could go into here. You can grab things from, from within the uh, the graphic editor itself or on the, uh, the graphics, but because we get things layered on top of each other, it can be pretty tricky sometimes to grab the individual component. So a lot of times it's just easier to uh, to grab it from the element pane. 
And I should be able to, from here, say I wanted to change that needle to, to green instead of red, just, uh, just for an example. So once I see, <clears throat> it's going to check in. You can see, hey, did I lie to you that everything didn't update here? Well, I couldn't update it quite yet because the window was open. These were all in there. So there is a little symbol down here that says update your graphics. If I were to close the window and reopen it, I'll save it, yes. And you can see just before it saved it, it loaded those newer changes in the graphic. So very easy to make changes to it. Um, if there was one that I didn't want to change, maybe I wanted one to be green, one to be red, one to be yellow. Easiest way really to do that because we still kind of like to have those global changes available is I could go into that original graphic now and just duplicate it. And so if I had one that was, um, you know, red needle instead of copy one, I could say, you know, red needle. Change that one back to red, and then I could come in and uh, swap the graphic out with the um, the alternate from there. Um, so the, that uh, ability to to have that uh, kind of parent child in is, is pretty powerful. Um, I was also going to show, could I add the needle color as a parameter? Yeah, I certainly could. What I would do, I can go into, I'll go into the one that I created here. <clears throat> That's where uh, we tie in custom properties. So if I look at this one now that I'm at the, uh, the base graphic, It'll have some custom properties associated with it, and that's where the min, the max, uh, value is set. And what I could do in here is add a new custom property as a string value. Oops, I could say color. Oh, sorry, that's a keyword. <laughs> I could say needle color. Oops. And I'm using the American spelling there. I apologize. <laughs> Make that a string value. <clears throat> and then typically, I'll take that over to a tag. And we've seen this here, the uh, the three dashes. That just means it's going to be assigned um, later on in, in a, um, when it's embedded in InTouch or changed to a square head. Sometimes you'll see in our stuff some descriptions, you know, um, the different colors that it's set up for. Or if it's a numerical value that's evaluating to a color, we can put that information in there so later on you know six months from now we can remember <laughs> what we did in there and then when we have things like um, let's see I would probably need to change that um, within a script in there because it would need to accept that value but anytime if we were in the script editor for example or setting up an animation yeah, I could probably do that from animation it already has an animation associated with it, but I should be able to add another one of a fill style. Uh, see, that one is going to come from just a Boolean bit. That's why it's probably going to make me do it as a script. So I'm going a little off, uh, <laughs> off topic here, but um, let me just uh, add that in as a script instead. So I'll cancel that. Just to show you, I'm not going to add it in. And if it doesn't work, I have to spend another five minutes of everybody's time trying to figure out why I screwed it up. But in here, we will have defined script. I could do it on a. I always forget I have to give it a, a name before I start setting things. So, a needle color, just the name of my script. I can do it from a data change. And when I start typing in, there's my custom property that I'll be assigning to it. So anytime that custom property changes, it would trigger the script. And then I should be able to find the needle. So that's the object itself. It should have an attribute probably of a dot. And it doesn't have a dot color. <laughs> Okay, so I might need to associate that, like I mentioned, with a um, with a truth table, and instead of using a string, give it a number: one equals red, two equals green, uh, and so on. But anyway, it really can be done. I'm not going to spend uh, too much more time on the 
on getting that. Uh, sorry, but uh, it's something that we could do using those custom properties. And let me see, it's probably, okay. Let me just show you since it does have a custom property in there. And even though I haven't tied it to the graphic rate yet, you can see the custom property. And this is where I could assign that to either an in-touch tag or to a uh, um, string value if I wanted to switch that over to a string, a static. So I'm very flexible when it comes to that. Um, I also wanted to show real quick, let me just get out of this one. And I'll just save it. I guess I didn't really need to save it so much, but uh, I'll go back into my InTouch application manager. Oops. Forgot to close window viewer. And uh, I'm going to convert uh, one of these demo applications. So I've taken a copy of this demo application 800 by 600, just put it in my documents. So um, same as we would normally in the old days here right now, take a, a copy of an InTouch app. So there it is, you know, I just copied and pasted the folder. And now that it's in there, when I go to open it up in Window Maker, it's going to ask me this, so actually let me say no first, because I don't want to convert the windows yet. What I want to do is lock the window size so it stays at 800 by 600, so it doesn't try and automatically convert it on me, because we all know how that works. So I'll lock the window size. <clears throat> I'll open up the application. Now it's going to tell me that you know it's 800 by 600. I have a different resolution. But do I want to convert the application without scaling the windows? So the application itself is going to end up at my computer size, which we need. But the windows and graphics are going to stay at 800 by 600. So it's not going to stretch or skew. It's not going to touch those graphics in any way. You can see this is our standard um, uh, reactor demo. Do The conveyor is a full screen one. So just to show you, you know, if we did want to go now to uh, 1366 by 768. <clears throat> I have to grab everything, try and convert it into a group because if I grab an individual piece, uh, it's all uh, it's all individual components. And as those individual components scale up, it's not very pretty. Um, why did it not? Hold on. You know what? I must have already converted this one probably during my testing because it didn't asked me to create it as a, um, a modern application. So I can see there's no orchestra graphics. So easy fix for that, or it was already at the right version. So since it didn't have to convert the application version, it, it left it at that, which is fine. What I can do then is go into import it. So I will go to import. And now I want to find the application, same as we did before, except uh, not with the little glasses. I'll browse to, and I apologize, sorry, I meant to, I guess during my testing I had done that, but in all the excitement of the WebEx, I uh, I forgot that it was a, a newer application. Oops, sorry, it's in my documents. There it is, okay. And I find, so there's my application. Yeah, I know where to put it. Just call it modern. Oops, I'll call it modern because I ran out of letters for my application. Now you can see it's creating a modern InTouch app in the background. So when the, the version is already at its appropriate version, uh, or at the latest version, it doesn't trigger that uh, that conversion. It sort of converts it for my application, but it's it's only during that uh, that change older version that wants to automatically make it into a modern app. So the fact that I've imported it this way now, automatically you can see it didn't ask me if I wanted to change it because it knew if I was at that version and importing it, that's what I was importing it for was to create that modern application out of it. <clears throat> Sorry for the confusion there. So again, takes another you know minute, maybe minute and a half compared to the uh, to doing it the the older way or creating a legacy application and converting it, but. Uh, for that extra minute, you do get uh, you do get your money's worth for your time. So. 
There we go. <clears throat> and I'll just show you this one thing real quick, um, and then I'll just show you the the way now we'll do our backups, and uh, and then I'll just open it up for questions. I don't want to take too much more of anybody's time. So you can see it still got the same version that it had, uh, but now it's a modern application as opposed to this one that I just opened and left it as a standalone. Okay, so what I wanted to show, I'll go back to that uh, to that conveyor application. You can see now we've got the big orchestra graphic toolbox. I'll move it over. I kind of got used to running it on this side for whatever reason. So all of our graphics are there and so on. But you saw that conveyor one. It's got all the individual components. But again, to try and resize that, pretty awkward. So what we can do, and I'm going to leave it closed because we need it closed to be able to do this. We click. We have the option of converting it to an orchestra symbol. <clears throat> I'll just show the details. Oh, this might happen too quick for me to see the details. But uh, it's converting it. Um, what it's going to do if I look at the conversion report, it's going to tell us, you know, the list of any errors, the errors that they were, where it came from, and uh, and so on. So if there was something that wouldn't convert in there, it's going to tell you exactly what it is, give you a pretty good idea of what it doesn't, and how that might affect uh, the running of the, of the system. Almost as good is it gives us a backup of that, uh, hopefully, right here. So the conveyor underscore back for backup, if I open it up, that's the old window. And so it's got everything as individual components, nothing's changed. So if, you know, for whatever reason, it doesn't work the way you want or the conversion fails, we have a mess. It's still there. But now, I will save it. I must have moved something a little bit. When we go to conveyor one, now we can see it's just one giant object. And so if I were to change my actual window size to 13. 66 by 768. So now, of course, our background of our screen much bigger. And now our graphic, if I want to resize it, I can just hold down shift to take that ratio and resize it. You can see it resizes the entire graphic, keeps everything where it was, doesn't make a big mess of things. And I can take it to that aspect ratio of my new monitor. Going to runtime. <clears throat> so now um, you do have to be careful. I'll show you this after it goes into runtime. That you know these vector graphics are scalable, but uh, you can still run into to issues with uh, uh, with stretching and skewing. There's the ejector. I forget the complete <laughs> control for this uh, for this application. I believe there's a control panel in here somewhere. But anyway, I'm not worried too much about the application. It's to show you the uh, the actual conversion for it. So where I mentioned you do have to be careful with stretching and skewing. Is still, if our aspect ratio is off, let me just make this smaller. And again, if we wanted to go down to a really small screen, you can see it uh, it does that conversion down to a small level quite as well but if i had something that was suddenly you know i went from say a four by three ratio to 16 by nine if i don't maintain an aspect ratio it'll still stretch everything out there's there's really no way around that that's just the nature of any graphic but as long as i hold down shift when i make it larger keeps that ratio and if there's a little room on either side i could always put some some key performance indicators or um you know, some more processed data on the screen to kind of fill it out so we don't have blank spots in there. So much easier to deal with. Now, because this was a pre-built graphic, all of the in-touch tags now are converted as part of the orchestra graphic. If you see when I go double click, there's no custom properties. It's because it just took that and kind of hard code everything. So if you did need to change some IO, we could just go into the graphic itself, into the graphic editor, <clears throat> and you'll see all of the individual groups, like we, uh, not as pretty as a pre-built orchestra graphic because it's named, it just converted everything. But as I picked whatever individual one, we can see that's the, uh, that um, barrel. And I can tell, excuse me, that there's an animation in there because I get the little film strip. So if I want to change it, so that's coming from the in-touch tag called cycle, cycle equals five. 
So if I wanted to change that value to, to either a different value or to change it to a different tag or add some functionality, I could do the animations through there. So nothing is locked in. It just kind of, because of the conversion, we have to get to it through the graphic editor as opposed to, to creating everything as custom properties. So the last thing that I wanted to mention just for the quick uh, time that we have left before I open it up is the, uh, the backup. So remember in the, uh, the early easy days, we could just go into that, uh, that folder where it's, <laughs> I always forget to shut down in touch or window viewer. Uh, we could go into the folder where the, where it was, I did that too quick, where it was stored just using Windows Explorer, copy and paste or zip it up or store it. So it was a really easy, uh, really easy backup. Still very, very manual because you had to go find the location which it shows it in the path uh, and zip it or copy it. So now it's Sorry, I was just the uh, conference call thing was trying to disconnect me there. Thought I had spoken long enough, I guess. Um, so the backup, like I said, it, it's not any harder. It's just a little bit different now. So when we do a backup, we would select the one we wanted to backup. And we can either right click or go to the file menu and then we get to export. It's going to prepare to export. <clears throat> Excuse me. And give us, you know, standard where we want to store it, uh, and so on. I could just put it on the desktop. We could call it whatever we want. You could call it a version number, underscore today's date, what have you. And it saves it as this AA or Orchestra package file. So that's just going to be a, kind of a way that we typically zip up um, these Orchestra. Uh, and now when I do want to take this over to a new application uh, or to a new machine or restore it on this one, I could just go to File and Import, grab that AAPKG file, and reopen it. And it's going to uh, it's going to either create that from scratch on the old system or overwrite it if, if we want on this one. So <clears throat> the reason why we can't just grab that file like we used to and take that is because now there's a database in the background. It's imported in the export. It actually packs up all that database information. And the export packs it up. The import takes that information from the database, recreates that database in your new application. So if we just grab those files, um, we're not going to have everything that we need. So again, is it a tough procedure? No, as you can see, it's really a, a click and a, and a place to store it. But it is different. When people have done things the same way for uh, you know, 10 or 15 years, it, uh, can we import windows into an application? Yes, we can. Uh, when it comes to the individual window, import and export, it's exactly the same as it's always been. So when you're within the InTouch application itself, export windows gives you the list of windows that you want to export. And when you do the import windows uh, into the new application, same thing, it'll give you, you know, ask you where the windows are stored, which ones you want to import. It'll change all the tags to um, uh, those placeholder tags. And when you import it, you have the option of using local tags uh, or remote tags or leave the placeholder. So the actual window import and export hasn't changed in any way. The, the, the only difference within the application of the import, and I showed you that, is I can right click on an orchestra graphic in the toolbox, one that we've created ourselves typically. So we wouldn't need to import and export those existing ones unless we change them and want to change them back. Um, export and then um, import them into your new application, just file, import, orchestra graphic. Uh, I saw another question, it popped up. Can we uh, export multiple windows from a legacy app and bring them into a modern app? Um, I believe, and I'd have to double check this, but I'm pretty sure, because it used to be like this with the older InTouch, um, we can export from a legacy app as long as it's at the same version. So typically we'd have to take that app, um, convert it, maybe it could even be left as a legacy app. Um, so convert it up to 2014 R2, then we can export from that and bring it into our modern application, no problem. 
And I, I can I can double check that to see if it has to be imported to the latest version first. But I'm I'm 99% sure about that because I know we used to have to do that uh, in the older InTouch. I don't think that's changed. So I mean, there's always more that I could uh, show within the modern app and. And there's so much within the orchestral graphic editor that we can work with. It's a really, uh, a really big editor, but I won't uh, show any more. I see someone's, uh, someone's typing here, so we got a few more questions in. So I'll just take the last, uh, last few minutes to, to answer any questions that have, uh, have popped up. And um, I'll let everybody get back to their day here pretty soon. Yeah, I didn't get into showing. Oh, there it goes. How do you deploy an updated application? Uh, before you could just copy the folder. Yeah, well now, um, it's pretty much the same. Uh, there's two ways that you can do it. Uh, we still support the NAD, the Network Application Development. Uh, or, so for example, to thin client. Um, so yeah, we could do the Network Application Development, which you set up a shared folder um, on all the machines that you want to access the master. So you only change the master application and have everybody look at that shared folder. And uh, after it's changed, you can notify the clients and update that change. <clears throat> so that uh, that NAD configuration hasn't changed with the modern InTouch app. When it comes to taking it over to um, to a different machine, so again, like like Leanne mentioned, in the old days we had just copied the folder over to the new the new machine and started up. We could essentially just do the same thing here. Um, you would go over to the new machine when you open up the InTouch application manager. Instead of seeing it directly from the list, you would just have to um, to do that import on it. Once it's imported, then you could go into um, into Window Viewer. So that really it hasn't changed much from there, other than you know in the file and copy and where you would have to find instead of doing the find. Well, we do the find, but find and then import. So it's uh, yeah. um, we can also now, if uh, depending on your setup, we still have the option of publishing an InTouch application. And what the publishing does is it kind of takes um, takes this, removes that connection to the database, publishes it out as a uh, that flat InTouch file structure, exactly like it's been for for decades now. You could copy that over onto your machine, just copying the folder. Thing is, when it's published now, that um, that folder, that uh, application, you can't directly change that one. When you want to come back and make changes, add to it, you come back to original, make your changes, and republish. Um, so, in the case of a publishing, that that folder that gets created looks exactly like the old index folder. In fact, I can show that. Um, and let's go to publish. I'll just put it on the desktop as well <clears throat> and just open it up. Really the only difference between this and an InTouch 9.5 app that you'll see from the file structure is this will have a, um, a their folder for orchestra symbols. But you can see if we had more, we've got the uh, the individual windows, tag name.x uh, file for the tag name dictionary, the, the InTouch I and I file. Now if you wanted to, to manage it that way, no problem. We could just like we used to in the old days, uh, copy this over to the new machine, uh, open up InTouch Application Manager, you find the app, open it up. The orchestra graphics are going to be there. They're going to work uh, as they did you know, during testing. So it doesn't change that structure at all. It's just now this becomes uh, becomes published. And at one point in time, we used to be able to change a, a published app. We just couldn't add. Um, new orchestra graphics into it, um, but I tried to just on the training last week and now we've kind of locked a published app. So if we try and change it, it's going to say, well, this app has been published, go back to the original, which is really the way that it should have been. Uh, so I see a few more people typing, so we've got a couple more questions. Uh, it's good to see that the date stamps are not all just now for published application. Um, yeah, sometimes uh, you know we take, <laughs> take some of these things into consideration. Um, it will when I go and um, 
if I certify for that app, it should still have the same application version uh, and so on. Uh, so from Leanne, previously we, were, we wrote scripts to copy the folders to the required locations because we didn't want to use an ad, then just had to restart the session when in front of the machine. Seems that this will be more manual. Not huge, but definitely a few more steps. Uh, yeah, in the case where you were, um, you were using your own uh, NAD setup, kind of like that, it would be a few extra steps unless um, you did that publishing, like I mentioned. So if you if you pub it out after you made the change, well, I guess it would still be an extra step, but the extra step just of publishing to the uh, to the folder that you're using for your um, your kind of pre-made uh, your NAD your, your user defined NAD, I guess you could say. Welcome. Uh, um, oh, and uh, one other thing that I should mention here too, we talked about the uh, the export being a little bit different. The other thing that's a little different that I did wrong the first time is when I wanted to delete one of these applications. So I had a bunch, uh, like we have here, a bunch of demos, a bunch of tests, and I went and just went into the InTouch folder that they were stored in and deleted them. Now, because we have that uh, database background, we can't delete that way anymore. We can, and it just, it'll be errors uh, on the machine for quite a while after that. because. It does create that database in the background, and that database, of course, doesn't delete it from your SQL server unless you do. Um, you can delete it manually, but when we do want to delete one of these, uh, whether it's any one of these modern ones, as long as we do the deletion from the InTouch Application Manager, you'll see it gives us the uh, the warning. It'll permanently delete the folder and its content, contents, and so on. If it was developed locally, and you'll see it brings up the view details. And it actually deletes the database. This is actually the database name here with that gross uh, user ID. The reason why we don't give the name of the database to be the application name is because we don't want people in there necessarily making changes to that database. It's not there to be a user accessible database. It's just there to give us the, that connection we need to be able to, um, to bring in the .NET framework and the graphics. A uh, question from Harbgash, uh, how easy is it to convert InTouch 7 at one of our clients to the InTouch 2014 R2 modern application? Uh, from version 7, if it was 7.11 or if it's version 7, uh, between 7 and 7.11 there was, don't remember whether it was a database change or that's when it went from 16 to 32 bit. So it needs to be, as long as it's, um, if it was after 7.11, all you need to do is open the application um, just, you know, like we normally would, search for it, open it up, and it's going to convert it automatically. If it was version 7 or earlier, it needed to go to 7.118 or 9 first to, to get over that, um, that kind of structural difference. So it doesn't need to be touched, uh, or should say it doesn't need to be touched. It doesn't need to be modified. It just needs to be opened in one of those preliminary versions. Uh, I've done it here. I've got in touch. Uh, I believe it's just 9.5 on my XP mode on my Windows 7 machine, and I've done that for these uh, for these conversions. Just open it up. When you open it up, then uh, anything past 7.11 in the latest version, it will open it up automatically. So done that here uh, in the past. We have version four applications, because and, and I have to I keep forgetting which ones which went straight in my mind between um, version four and version five, and between seven and seven one one. One of them was a database change. One of them was a um, that sixteen to thirty two bit change. Okay, thanks, Leanne. Um, I see some people have to run. So anyway, I'll just leave it off as that. Uh, if there's no other questions, to say that that conversion. From the version, there's no um, uh, no engineering changes that need to be made. It just needs to be opened. It's depending on the version, it may need to be opened twice uh, to get into that. So if you want uh, to do some testing with that, that's something that we can uh, give you a hand with. Or if you know the, the actual full version, just let us know, and we can tell you whether whether it needs that uh, intermediate stage or not. But typically, like Wonderway has always done, uh, that conversion is quite easy. In fact, usually um, nothing other than opening the app.
Uh, contact if you need help in converting. Uh, well, the best probably to begin with is be to contact your sales rep. Um, now, whether that's uh, Jason Jacobs here or or Edward Fontaine, um, he'll be able to uh, to get you to the appropriate person. Uh, and there's there's myself in here. There's Alex, and uh, we've hired a new new support technician named Andrew. Um, if we're busy, though, we have three people in. Um, I guess three now. <laughs> yeah, three people in Montreal as well, who can help with the same thing. And that's why I say probably best to uh, give that first uh, first contact for something like that through your sales rep, and he'll make sure that uh, you know if if the three of us are are tied up or busy or not available, then he can get somebody in Montreal to take a quick look at it. So, standard, um, if it comes through like just regular tech questions, that sort of thing. Uh, there is a number that's not really on anybody's business cards, but I'll mention just since I have a few people on the line. Uh, if you call 905-829-9301, that's actually our integrated tech line. So it doesn't get you to a specific tech person, but what that does is it rings in all three of our offices here in Ontario. It'll ring through all three of the offices in Montreal. And then if for whatever reason everybody's tied up, it does go to a, um, a voicemail, but it doesn't just die in a general mailbox. What happens is it actually gets emailed to all six of us. So uh, I know a lot of people don't like to leave emails when it just is a general mailbox like that. And I understand. I don't like to leave that either. But um, the fact that it actually gets, uh, it takes a WAV file recording of it and emails it to all of us, it's a great way to make sure that the next person who's, uh, who's available grabs it and all of the info is there. It's not, uh, it's a lot easier for us to transcribe it because we can play it back and change the volume. <laughs> I don't know if that's slowing it down and speeding it up, but uh, it's a permanent recording. Excellent. Um, so unless there's any other questions, so oh, I see uh, people still typing, so. It's a little strange doing this with everybody muted. Uh, I kind of <laughs> feel a little bit isolated, but uh, yeah, at least I know pe some people are there because of the questions that have came through. So I'll get uh, I'll get used to that after a while. Well, I'm not sure. Oh, somebody else is typing here. So. And of course, any uh, any follow-up uh, questions after we do kind of wrap up, or if you do want to look at something a little more in depth, uh, you know that's always something that can be arranged. Uh, pretty easy for us to jump on. Okay, excellent. Marie Eve says she needs a little time to play with it to have questions, and exactly I'm the same way. Always looks good while you're uh, while you're looking at it. Once you start to get into it, start to try it. That that's when the questions come up. So like I said, as yeah, these do come up. You know, by all means, send them out to uh, to ourselves or to your sales rep. And if anybody does want to look at anything in more detail, um, just let us know. We can set up something a little more specific to uh, whether it's to an application or even if it's components that we've just briefly touched on within the hour. We can always spend that uh, spend a little more time kind of directly on it. And like I mentioned, I believe unless we have had some some audio issues, that this has been recorded. So we'll we'll pop this online, and if anybody wants to look at it later, if there's somebody in your organization that uh, you know wanted to come but uh, scheduling just didn't allow it, uh, this will be available. 